Shia. Honestly, there, there's a girl who stole it. She threw her out, and the next one played off first place. And she came up with the ball and said, I'm gunning you too. <laughs> and the young said, Don't mock the other player. And he said, She didn't have a chest. They did. <laughs> but when she was coming out of the and said, This weepy, sweet little girl, and she came out and said, oh, Those great cars that are at our house. She points to me, That's my school. <laughs> and the boys were just laughing at her. Good morning. We're so glad you're here at Central Baptist Church. Thank you so much for joining us in person, or if you are at home listening, or if you're going to see this later when you look it up online. But we are glad you're here. We'd like for, we'd like for you to be in touch with us. If there's some need you have, call the office or call one of us and tell us so we, at least we can pray for you and care for your needs. Would you join us as we begin to worship as Fran leads us with a prelude? Thank you.
Amen. There was a, a competition for composers, and they wanted um, people under 25 years old who were writing new compositions to submit them. And it was put on by Word Music. And Word Music had a 16-year-old kid turn in a piece of music that he had composed. Now, usually when a 16-year-old turns in a piece of music, everybody snickers and says, isn't that sweet? Well, he won. His name was David Meese. And the name of the song was One Small Child. Now, the, the, that's the lead up to the fact that our Christmas cantata is going to be named this year One Small Child because we have just ordered it. It's coming in. And we'll do a commercial at the end, but some of you singing aren't up here, and that's a shame. I've had people come to me and say, I cannot physically be up there, but I would if I could. That, that is wonderful. But if you can sing and you can physically be up here, we would love to have you. We're Wednesday night at 740 after Bible study, so we would love to have you. Now, that's, this is our first Sunday for choir to start back.
called to worship this morning is from Psalm 78, verses 1 through 4 and 12 to 15. My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power, and the wonders he has done. He did miracles in the sight of their ancestors in the land of Egypt, in the region of Zion. He divided the sea and led them through. He made the water stand up like a wall. He guided them with the cloud by day and with light from the fire at night. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them water mm -hmm. as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. This is the reading of God's word. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Would you stand please and turn to hymn number 303 and sing with us, Jesus shall reign where the sun. thank you for allowing us to come again into your house and to worship you on a Sunday morning freely in America. We can commune with you and praise your name. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings you've given us. We thank you for the rich heritage of freedom in our country. Lord, we see people in our country who do not know you, and we ask that you do your will in their lives. We ask that 
as servants of yours that we would be used by you to spread your word to all these lost individuals. Lord, we ask that you would continue to provide watch care guidance and direction in our lives and that those who are not with us today that you would protect, you would give them traveling mercies and bring them back home safely. Lord, we ask that as Josh brings us your message this morning, that he would bring us your words of encouragement that would help us in our walk for thee. We ask all these things in thy holy and blessed name and for thy sake, amen. Be seated. The gospel reading today is from Matthew 21, verses 23 through 32. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism. Where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. This is the reading of God's word. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. We're going to uh, do the same thing we've done each month. This is a song called Resurrection Power that was in second service. And so we're going to do it for a few weeks and then you can join us uh, at the end of the month. You call me from the grave I need. You call me out of all my shame. I see the old has passed away, the new has come. Now I have resurrection power. Living on the inside, Jesus, you have given us freedom. No longer bound by sin and darkness, living in the light of your goodness, you have given us freedom. Now the next one um, is not in your hymn book, so don't grab for the red book. Uh, we're going to do, um, I'll, I'll prepare you for that ahead of time, okay? And it is one, the wondrous cross. You're going to know it. It'll be familiar, but it's not right in the hymn book. Okay.
me come and talk and find that I may truly live. Oh, the wonderful cross, oh, the wonderful cross, all who gather here by the grace strong here to the reading this morning is from Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 13. Therefore if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love being one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, For it is God who has works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. This is the reading of God's word. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. For our response, let's sing a stanza of Knowing You.
going to be our Miss Cindy today and she is as we sing oh how I love Jesus Becky would you come down and tell our children's story you to help around the house, maybe feed the pets, or ask you to dry the dishes, or maybe help outside and rake the leaves. Well, I have a story today about a dad who had two sons. John and William. Dad asked John to rake the leaves and bag them. And you know what John said? He said no. He told his dad no, he wasn't going to do it. He was working on a Lego project and he wanted to get it finished that day. So dad was disappointed, but he went to his son William, who was watching TV. And William said, sure, dad, I'll rake the leaves. And dad was happy that William said that. So dad took the rake and the bags, and he put them outside, and he went to work. Now John, who had said no, got to thinking about that. And he said, you know, I can do the Lego project later. I have lots of time. So he went outside and started raking those leaves. When dad came home, he was so happy to see John doing the raking, but he asked where William was, and John said, he's still inside watching TV. Now who do you think dad was more pleased with? John, who first said no, but then raked the leaves, or William, who said yes and didn't break the leaves. He was probably happier with John because he did what he said he was going to do. So Jesus wants us to realize that what we say and what we do are very important, but it's more important with what we do. And sometimes we talk the big talk. Sometimes we go to church in Sunday school, we read our Bibles, we go to bugs, and then we're not very nice to our friends. And Jesus wants to, us to realize that what we do is more important than what we say we're going to do. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, sometimes we say yes, but our actions say no. Help us to be faithful to do what you have called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Could I ask the ushers please to come forward?
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you now for the opportunity to give back a portion of what you've given to us. You provide us with everything in our lives that is good. Lord, and now we have the opportunity to, to dig deep and give sacrificially back to your kingdom to help further the work that you do in our community and in the world. We thank you, and in your name, we ask your blessing. Amen. From whom all blessings flow, praise Him, all creatures He below, praise Him, above ye heavenly host, praise Father, Son, and Holy seated. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Josh. If we haven't met before, I am simply a follower of Jesus Christ, who is like a blind beggar that found a table full of bread and is now trying to share it with other people. So may you eat uh, from the bread that God has given us today. Well, today we're going to be looking at three scriptures from the book of Hebrews that are all connected. And as a Christian, what, as Christians, what we believe is that the Bible is not just a, a book of man's words. It's a book in which God has spoken through human beings who wrote and spoke the different words in scriptures. God was speaking through them to humanity to reveal himself. And so these are not just dead words on a page. These are living words of God that we can hear and listen to, and hold on to, and believe, and put into practice, and become alive. So now listen to these words from first the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He, meaning Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he, meaning Jesus, is upholding the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited 
is far more excellent than theirs. And if we go to Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 10, it says, Forever, For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by that same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and the spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Finally, in Hebrews chapter 7, starting in verse 22, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number, because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, meaning Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And as Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are our great high priest who sympathizes with us in our weaknesses. You are gentle and lowly in heart. And you invite us to draw near to you, Lord, that you might save us that you might bless us, that you might strengthen us. So we come this morning, Lord, and I ask with my friends here today that you would speak to each one of us about your grace, your truth, your love, your power, your care, your kindness, your gentleness, your prayers for us, and that we might have life as we believe in you, the living word of God. Bless us now by your spirit. Open our hearts and our minds and our souls to you. In your name, amen. Back in 1999, I went to college as a freshman at Culver Stockton. And when I was there, I was on the football team. And about the fourth game of the season, I think, we were playing our homecoming game against Mid-America Nazarene. And we had already had several quarterbacks get hurt, and they were out for the season. And so somehow, as a freshman, I was now on the field in the homecoming game. Near, it was near halftime, and uh, we had a play. It was a quarterback draw. And so I ran, and I was, went about 20 yards down the field, and I was going out the right sideline there near the stands. And as I was going out of bounds, one of the players from Mid-America Nazarene dove and tackled me and hit me right in my knee. And my knee hyperextended. And in that moment, my ACL was popped, shattered in half, torn in half. And from that time on, I was no longer able to walk or run apart from someone else's strength in me. And so what happened then is I had to go down to Columbia, Missouri, and a very great surgeon named Pat Smith, who did a lot of the surgeries for the Missouri Tigers and the Kansas City Chiefs, um, he did a surgery on me. And in that surgery, he took a part of a dead person, a cadaver graft, someone else's patella tendon who had donated their body to be used for others, they took uh, the patella tendon, which is that tendon that goes over your kneecap, and a piece of bone, and a piece of bone, and apparently this is what he told me that he did. He twisted it, 
and then he drilled a hole in the bones of my leg and then inserted that tendon in my knee so I would have an ACL, anterior crucial ligament. And then they attached it, however, and um, now I've had a part of a dead person living inside of me since 1999, 24 years, 24 years. And now yesterday, I went to the John Wood Community College Trail, and uh, I like to go and go for a run there. And there's a, a track back there, a, a, a trail that goes about 1.25 miles. And I decided yesterday that I was going to try and run it faster than I ever had. And so, um, you know, I've lost a little bit of weight, and my Achilles tendon has healed from when it was hurting really bad. And so I was able to run 1.25 miles on that trail in 11 minutes and 13 seconds. Now, nobody saw me run that on TV, but I thanked God that I could do that yesterday. But it was only because there was a part of a dead person living inside of me, giving me strength and stability to run the race that was marked out for me. You see where I'm going here? There were three scriptures that I quoted here that all had to do with the word of God, which many people think that the words in this book are just dead words, just words on a page. But for the Christian, we believe that this is the living word of God and that when we believe in Jesus and his words, they make us alive. It says that the word of God is planted inside of us and starts growing and bringing life through us. The Christian doesn't say that I am more like Christ or I am good in my life because of what I've done. It's because Jesus has planted himself inside of me. Christ crucified lives inside of me now and he is producing good fruit in my life. And so... Let's talk about the word of God from this scripture here. The first passage was in Hebrews chapter 1. Did you hear what it said about what Jesus is doing right now? It says, who is he? He is the radiance of the glory of God. So if you wanted to look at God, Jesus says, look at me and you see God. He is the radiance of the glory of God. The magnificence of God was poured into a human being, became a human being, and lived among us. As John chapter 1 says what? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14 it says, The Word, who is Jesus Christ, he is the Word of God, became flesh and dwelt among us. Became human. The Word of God is a human being. It is a person. It is Jesus Christ. And he came and dwelt among us. But then he died the death that we deserve on the cross. That's the offering purification for sins that it talks about here. And now he was raised from the dead and he ascended and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. And what is he doing? This is in verse 3. He is upholding the universe by the word of his power. Who is upholding the universe? Jesus Christ. That's what Christians claim. He's not just a mere prophet. He's not just a good moral teacher. He was way more than that. So that right now, everything in this world is holding together by forces like in the, the, the center of an atom, in the nucleus, there are protons and neutrons. And for some reason, those protons and those neutrons stick together. Why? The Bible says it's because Jesus has put a force inside of them. He is upholding the universe by the word of, its, of, of his power. And within those protons and neutrons, some of you who have studied these things, you may have heard a proton is made of three quarks, and a neutron is made of three quarks. Two up and one down on each side, I don't know which way it is, but for some reason those quarks inside of the neutrons and protons are holding together. Why? God put that power in them, and God is continuing to hold them together by the word of his power. And then the electrons are going around somehow, and that's how we have electricity that we have harnessed for our use. What causes the electrons to do that? There's a power that God has put in the universe. And then finally, the, the other force, gravity. Here we are, stuck to this earth, not flying off of it. Why? Because of the, the word of Jesus is holding us together. 
He's holding everything together right now. And even the breath that you breathe is a gift from God. And if God were to withdraw his hand, even for a moment, everything would disintegrate into nothing. That's what it says, is that Jesus is holding everything together. It's kind of like when, when Jesus was on the, the sea in a boat sleeping, and there was a storm. You ever heard this story before? Right? And uh, the, the storm is a really uh, big storm, and the disciples are, are scared out of their minds. And they come to Jesus, and they wake him up, and they say, Master, don't you care about us? Don't you care that we're perishing, that we're about to die? You ever feel that way in your life? Like the water of the world and your own sin and your, your fear and your worry or depression or discouragement or just the troubles that overwhelm you, that they're pouring into your boat and you feel like your boat is going to sink? And it seems like God is asleep. And you don't even know if he's still in your boat. You don't know if he's really in control or not. Well, the disciples, they go and they wake Jesus up. Master, don't you care? And so Jesus gets up, and this isn't the Bible, but I, I kind of think he might yawn, you know, stretched a little bit. And he didn't wave any magic wand. He didn't do some kind of incantation. He spoke to the wind and the waves. Do you talk to the wind and the waves? Oh, you don't either? Why not? Because you're not crazy? You, you don't think they'd obey you? Well, Jesus, either he was crazy or he was something more than crazy. He was God himself, and he spoke, and what did he say? Two words in, in the Greek, but it's peace, be still. You might think, a rowdy group of children, shut up and sit down. <laughs> be quiet, be still. And what happened? The atoms in the wind and the waves, the hydrogen and the oxygen... And everything in the air, the nitrogen, they obeyed the voice of Jesus Christ in that moment. Why? Because they recognized his voice. It was the same voice that made them in the beginning. You, have, you want to say something, Jerem? He's just waving at me. Sorry, my son's over here. So they obeyed the voice of Jesus, and creation does this, but you know what? We're human beings. We've been created in the image of God, and we're special. We get the choice as to whether we are going to obey God and his word or not. It doesn't happen automatically for us like it does with the wind and the waves. You get a choice today whether you will hold on to the voice of Jesus Christ and seek to obey and live out his word. And he says, if you do that, when the storms of life come, you will be like a house that was built on the rock. And the storm will not bring you down. The wind will not bring your life down because you are putting into practice the very word of God. The second uh, scripture that I read, it talks about entering into the rest of Jesus. You know what the rest is that we are to enter into? That God is in control of all things. And then secondly, that Jesus has taken away all sins. God is in control of all things, and Jesus has taken away all sins so that now we can march confidently and boldly into the very presence of God because of the blood of Christ and say, God, I need your help. I need your mercy. I need your grace. It says, now let us strive to enter the rest. How? The living word of God. Let me read again. It says, for the word of God is living and active Sharper than any two-edged sword. Who is the word of God? Jesus Christ. He is the living word of God speaking right now through his word. Hopefully through something I'm saying today. Something maybe resonating with you today. That's God speaking to you. And it's sharper than any double-edged sword. Piercing to the very center of our beings. So that we would say, yes God. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I acknowledge that you love me. I acknowledge that you're in control. And then as a Christian, you say, you have forgiven me because of your finished work on the cross, and I am accepted in your sight and delighted in as one of your beloved children. That is the rest that we get to enter into. And we can draw near to our great high priest, who it says can sympathize with our weaknesses. Why? Because the word of God, God himself became a human being. And went through the trials that we go through. And so when you're struggling, do you know that the Christian God that you believe in is the only God 
He is the only God. But in the theories of gods, he's the only one that says, I understand because I went through it myself. What you are feeling, what you are thinking, what you are struggling with, I went through those temptations myself and I understand. And I never sinned, in that Jesus says, he never sinned, but he says we can draw near to him to find grace and mercy in our time of need. Finally, I read from Hebrews chapter 7, where it talked about these other priests, the, the priests in Israel who worked in the temple, they all had to be replaced over and over again. Why? Because they died. So all these priests throughout the many years of Israel's history are being replaced over and over again by other priests because the priests that used to offer the sacrifice in the temple and pray for the people, they died. But it says here, Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant. You know what the covenant is? It's the covenant of grace that God, the living word of God, is our great high priest. And it says, he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. In Revelation chapter 1, 18, Jesus said, I died, but behold, I am alive forevermore. And then it says in verse 25, Consequently, because Jesus is this priest that has replaced all the other priests in Israel, he's the only priest now that we go to, it says, consequently, because he has done this, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. So what is Jesus doing right now? He's talking to God the Father. About who? about you and me, about God's children. Jesus is praying for you and me right now. He is living to intercede for us, and so he's able to save to the uttermost. What does that mean? What is the thing that you're dealing with that you're ashamed to admit to God? What is the thing that you're dealing with that seems like it's overwhelming to you and you can't handle it? How is it that you feel like right now that your life is falling apart or maybe it's something that happened a long time ago that now seems like it just has power over you that you can't get out from under. Jesus says he is able to save you. His, he says his prayers are more powerful than any trouble you are going through, than any sin you have done or was done to you. Jesus' prayers are more powerful than our fear and our anxiety and our worry. And when we trust Jesus... When we believe in him and his word, it's like his word becomes a part of us and we are alive to him. He is able to save to the uttermost because he lives to intercede for us as we draw near to him. One day I was uh, hanging out with my son Jerem over there. This I think was a couple years ago now. And uh, we were playing or something, and Jerem likes to express to me how he feels. He's a very expressive guy. And so he says to me, Daddy, you're my bestest daddy. You're my bestest daddy. And that just really touched my heart. And so I said to Jerem, Jerem, you're my bestest Jerem. And I think I might have given him a hug or something in that moment. I don't remember exactly. But I'll never forget the words of Jerem saying to me, Daddy, you're my bestest daddy. And me saying back to him, Jerem, you're my bestest Jerem. See, this is what faith is. You begin to believe that God is not just a ruler and a judge and an all-powerful, omnipotent king. But you begin to believe that he is your bestest daddy. And you begin to believe that in the gospel, he says to you, you are my bestest children, my beloved sons and daughters. That's what Jesus does for us. And then he prays for us. And if you believe in Jesus Christ today, let me tell you why that's there. Hebrews chapter 12 says that Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. You are the joy that was set before Jesus that enabled him to go through the cross so that he could get you back and me back 
God's beloved children, we are the joy of the Lord. We're the reward that Jesus got for running his race. And Simon Peter had to learn this. When the, the night when Jesus was betrayed, Jesus said, I'm going to go to the cross and die. And Peter said, arrogantly, Lord, I'll go to the cross. I'll go and I'll die with you, Lord. And Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. You know what Peter learned that night? Eventually he learned this lesson, that it was because of the prayers of Jesus on his behalf that his faith did not fail. And you need to know that today, that if you have faith, it's because Jesus created that faith in you by a gift of grace. Yes, you received his truth and believed that, but now he is living to pray for you, and your faith will not fail, not because of how strong you are, but because of how strong his prayers are for you. As Romans 8 says, God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And later on it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Then it says that Jesus is at the right hand of God, interceding for us. And then Paul concludes with this, for I am convinced that neither, neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor demons, nor principalities, nor any powers, nor the, the present, nor the future, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. May you and I believe that today. May we trust in the prayers and the living word of Jesus on our behalf in all things. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray that today we would go out and that your word would not just go in one ear and out the other, but it would sink down to the depths of our being, and that we would really believe that we are loved by you, that we are accepted and delighted in as beloved children, that our sins have been taken away, and that you are in control of all things. And now we can trust in you, Lord, with all of our heart, and lean not on our own understanding, but that we would acknowledge you in all of our ways so that you would make our path straight. Whatever's going on inside of us or outside of us in our lives today, may we do that because of your living word, your prayers for us. Thank you for your grace and your love. Pray this in your name. Amen. Let's now... We are. Let's now pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We're now going to celebrate the meal that Jesus told us to keep on his behalf, the Lord's Supper. As the diaconate prepares to serve the table of the Lord, would you sing with us a stanza of the communion hymn?
our Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and having given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As you receive the elements, if you'll take them and hold them, and we'll eat together after we all have them. My friends, Jesus loves you, the body of Christ broken for you. In the same way also, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and pouring it out, he said, this is the new covenant, the new covenant of grace, of my blood shed for the sins, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, we'll take the, the cup and we'll drink together.
have shed for you. My friends, the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. <clears throat> Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for being the perfect sacrifice to take away all of our sins. Thank you for being broken on the cross so that we would have life. Bless us now as we go out of this place to be filled with your love and your grace and your truth to love others as you have loved us first. In your name, amen. Our hymn of decision is number 566, Father, I Adore You. Would you stand, please? For sure is that our diaconate will be at the doors if you would like to give to our fellowship fund that goes to care for benevolent leads for mostly for our church and sometimes for others lord uh thank you for being here today and we're going to ask josh to close it. okay now receive the lord's benediction the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you the lord lift up his countenance the smile of his face upon you because of his grace in Jesus forever and ever. In his name, amen. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Hey, Jim.